News Radio 840 WHAS. Good Sunday morning, Bob Sekoler and the Louisville Real Estate Show here with you until the top of the hour. Thanks for joining us. Hopefully your Thanksgiving dinner continues to linger in the refrigerator and you're enjoying it on a daily basis. And joining us uh, this uh, post-Thanksgiving show, we've got Brad Lawler, owner of Home Team Inspection Service. 844-411-TEAM is his direct number. Also, Chuck Crosby, the Crosby Law Offices at 499-6360. And you can reach me, Bob Sekoler, to help you with your home, to sell it, to put it on the market, anything you need. You can reach me anytime on my cell phone at 376-5483. That's 376-5483. All right. We're still doing our COVID shows, which means you can see a rebroadcast on LouisvilleAnswers.com. That is LouisvilleAnswers.com. It's a redirect to our YouTube. Send me an email if you want your question on. Send it to Bob at WeSellLouisville.com. And then in the subject line, radio question. And then the subject itself or the body of the email put in what your question is. Let's start with Brad. Since he is joining us, here's one for you. Daisy loves old homes and sent us an email about purchasing one. She says, I'd love to own an older home in Old Louisville, but I'm concerned about the upkeep and repairs that will be needed. And she's wondering what should she look for and what can she expect in the types of repairs that will be required in an older home? Well, that is a great question. Every older home is going to be a little bit different. Uh, the the much, much older homes, let's go 120 years old and more. Uh, you know, when we're inspecting those, oftentimes we're finding wood foundations that are still in place. Uh, you will find additions that have been added that are more modern, uh, but the original portion of the house is still uh, sitting on 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 wood, uh, shockingly enough. Mm. Um, there are houses uh, in town uh, that still have knob and tube wiring in them. Uh, most of it has been uh, de-energized, as they say, but oftentimes we find uh, parts of the home that still have energized uh, knob and tube wiring. Sometimes that happens just because they add an extra outlet and somehow re-energize a, a system that they thought had taken out of commission. So I think the, the big things is you're really looking at the structure of the home, uh, what it's sitting on, what you know, how it's being contact with the ground, and you're looking at electrical. Those are the two biggest uh, concerns. After that, you know, a lot of the homes have been fully renovated at, you know, over time, uh, roofs, uh, you know, there's still some old slate type roofs that are out there um so the, the the great part about the old homes is they have an incredible amount of character the the bad part about the old homes is they have a great amount of character they're all kind of <laughs> hand built and hand constructed and everyone is a little bit different so if you're looking at buying one make sure that you're hiring a home inspector who knows how to inspect those older homes uh because not not all home inspectors um have the experience to be able to actually do a thorough inspection on some of those very older uh, historic homes in town. Got it. All right. Uh, and they're beautiful. Um, Old Louisville has well-known, documented, sought after by uh, many people around the world because of the, the beautiful community down in Old yeah. Louisville. Chuck, we go back over to you now. Albert is, and this is going to be a great question for Chuck. Albert is going to put his home on the market. He's filling out the disclosure and he knows that in the backyard, he has moles. And he's wondering, is there a place to disclose that and several other things? And we'll get into the other things in a second, because he's he's tearing apart these disclosures, wondering why th certain things are being asked for, like the methamphetamines, <laughs> if there's ever been a meth house, but other things that are more pertinent to the normal are not. So let's start with moles. Moles. Um tests but that's not in the house that's on the land so uh -huh. i don't know that that's well but in wait there. it ahead, there's an ahead. area for ponding water which yeah. is outside yeah. in the backyard yeah. i get that if but that, there's, that there's goes the, with flooding okay then there's the shared property at a driveway that's another thing that they ask for yeah but that's that's with any kind of piece of land that, that relates to title not just condition termites uh, in the garage or in a wood pile but that. that's also but that's also part of this a structure we're not talking structure here we're talking land back there um jeez ah, that's a good question um right. where well, there's more hang on there's okay more. keep going as we say, yes, there's more. He also wants to know why isn't a death that occurred in the home 
required disclosure uh, disclosure information because people die everywhere i mean that's that's just not something that is required okay. All right. now at some point they may but uh let's go back a you know a few years people die at home regularly mm. uh, uh unless you're willing to admit that there are ghosts and maybe you are uh i don't know that that's uh and i, I that's the reasoning behind it i'll tell you it's not a requirement by law uh you know now well, well that's actually the next question okay <laughs> you guessed it he yeah. wants to know isn't why isn't there an area to disclose if you think there are ghosts i i'm not joking here he's asking why can't you dis disclose if there were joke uh, ghosts in the home if you because felt that regardless there of what zach baggins says there's no proof of ghosts um <laughs> Okay. All right. Yeah. Now yeah. there are cases out there. There are cases out there where if a house has, um, and, and you know, it's, you, you can always see when a judge is trying to fit an extreme situation, uh, into, into a case. And as they say, extreme situations make bad law. However, up in New York, there was a house that was supposedly haunted mm -hmm. and, uh, nobody said anything about it. These people moved in from out of town. They found the house. Oh, my God, this house is so haunted. Let's get out of it. And they sued uh, to have the sale set aside. And the judge actually did set the sale aside, not because of ghosts, but because of a, uh, a bad reputation to the house. Uh, and if you look a little deeper into it, um, again, conspiracy, perhaps. Uh, but uh, like with the Amityville horror and all that, mm -hmm foreclosure issues trying to get out of a foreclosure so oh hey let's set the sale aside because of you know fill in the blank um which always took some fun out of the movie for me but uh, uh anyway right. yeah that's it's, my take on that if, so let me quick reverse here is there anything that you think should be in the disclosure form that's not as an attorney of years well, as as a person who has moles uh, currently in his front lawn, uh, I think you should have moles listed on there. Really? Are you kidding? <laughs> no, I'm not. Oh, uh, wow. I found what looked to me to be somebody just dumping a big pile of dirt on my driveway, mm -hmm. and it turned out to be moles. Now, luckily, uh, I'm on the HOA board, and uh, we've been getting complaints about there being a coyote in the neighborhood. Uh. Well, coyotes eat moles. So, oh, there oh, you go. Do, I they think go we can... do they dig and get the moles? Is that something? Yeah, but they no, also no, haven't, haven't seen cause, it happen. But the cause is a, a, a danger to dogs and smaller dogs as well. So there's a eh, real coyotes don't attack. Generally. Oh, really? OK. All right. Yeah, they're they're more of a it. if you're if you're limping around and you're pretty small, they might go after. Oh, you. but that's still bad. Chuck, come on. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. All right. You or got if you're a road Or if you're a road runner. Yeah. Maybe. You know, you know what I've heard <laughs> for the moles? What? go to um, a place that cuts hair and ha gather up all the hair cuttings on the floor that they sweep into a yeah, whatever yeah. They, and stuff the hair into the holes that the moles make. They end you up know killing what? them, I, scratching them. I'd rather, I'd rather have pet moles. Okay, there you go. <laughs> and next thing we'll be know, he's naming those moles. All right, all right. so let's, let's move on. Uh, Kelly writes in, Brad, uh, he's selling his house. Buyer wants an exhaust fan in the basement bathroom and second floor uh, bathroom in the center. And Telly says when he bought the home back in 2003, the inspector never mentioned it. So he's wondering, the inspector that he used, why should he pay to install the exhaust fans now since it wasn't uh, required or at least it wasn't reported in 2003? Well, so probably these, I'm going to guess these, these bathrooms have windows. Uh, if the bathrooms have windows, then there's not necessarily a requirement for the exhaust fan. So mm -hmm. I don't know if that's the case. Um, I have seen uh, homes that have been built with uh, bathrooms in the basement, showers, you know, in, in enclosures in the basement that don't have mm -hmm. ventilation. That is a real problem just because of the moisture buildup uh, getting into all of the, all of the, uh, the drywall, all of the wood. Um, so it is something you definitely want to do now, whether or not a home inspector missed it, I, I can't really say, but if there's a, if there's a window in that, in that bathroom, that is the ventilation that is, uh, that would have been required really on, at any time um if they if they do install uh a vent 
in particular in that second story uh, where they go up into the attic, they want to make sure they take it all the way out, either through the soffit or through the roof and not vent the bathroom um, into the attic itself. Cause that's, you're creating a moisture problem in your, uh, in your attic when you do mm -hmm. that. Home inspectors will call that out too. Got it. But the good news is if you've got a window, you don't have to put the event in and that's the right. response in the repair request. So we want to talk on now and continuing about the best tips to winterize your house or your condo and, Chuck's case and many others. So some of the simple things that we go and feel free gents to jump in. If you've got some advice, check and clean your gutters. Cause that's a source of water overflowing and ice and then having problems right. when leaves and other debris clog your gutters. If you can uh, cause it can cause water to pool and freeze. And as it freezes, it creates icicles and ice dams. So that can, and falling icicles can also hurt you. Also set your filling uh, fans to rotate clockwise right so it's pushing the air up and around the room right okay replace your air filters and that's a reminder for me to do that as well because that's a way of inefficient uh, heating and air conditioning well in this case heating caulk window gaps and consider if you want insulation film uh if you see a window gap and then we've talked about on the previous show those things that fit under your door I don't know right. what they're called. Uh, you can yeah, I, I mean, I've yeah. heard them called draft dodgers. I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's just it's it's basically like a giant piece of weather stripping, you know. And I think you were talking about last one of the last shows about yeah. getting one that's actually held onto the Velcro, which is uh, which is it's a new. nice thing. Yeah. yeah, that's a nice setup. I don't know if it works as well as the one that has two tubes, one that goes outside and one that goes inside, right. but I'll let you know on that. Okay. Another another suggestion is drain your water heater. Now, what do you? I, I'm not sure that the average person wants to go through that. But all year long, the water heater is building up uh, with minerals and sediment uh, with heat, and you can force a water heater to work harder and heat your water hotter. Uh, do you suggest doing that as well? So, you know, it's interesting. We get this. If if you've got a water heater that's any age at all and you've never done that, just be prepared that when you open that valve, that valve's not going to close. Okay, so if you if you decide you want to do a regular really? drain to mm -hmm. get the sediments and the rust, you know, potential rust out of there, just make sure you know that you may not be able to close that valve. Um, those things will stick uh, when they're not not operated regularly. Uh, they will become a problem, and now you've got a repair cost with that valve. So just just proceed cautiously on that. Make sure you can shut the water off to that tank before you start trying to drain it out. Good point. Finally, in our group of these suggestions, insulate exposed plumbing pipes, check hoses, and faucet for leak. And when it gets down to sub-zero temperatures, Brad, uh, and you've got an outside exposed uh, vanity with um, plumbing underneath it, right. what are your suggestions? Well, I always keep, you know, I've got a couple, of, uh, two two sinks in my house that are on, on exterior walls. So what I do is I keep the cabinet doors open. Um, you know, at night and I keep the water, you know, running and I know we've, we've debated on how much water, I mean, I use, you know, just basically the width of a, of a skinny pencil, um, that much water flowing through it because water's cheap, uh, ruptured pipes are expensive. So i um, maybe I use more water than some, but, uh, just anything you can do to get a little bit of heat into those enclosed spaces by opening those cabinet doors and running water, that'll be a big help. The other one, uh, there are a lot of washing machines that will, there are also on the outside walls. Those are very, very susceptible to uh, to rupturing too. So th that's another area to watch um, is your laundry room. Um, just make sure you don't have an exposed pipe there. Am I right in saying that if the laundry room is in the basement against the uh, uh, bricks, uh, and the, you're fine, right? You're fine there. Yeah, they, yeah I below mean, ground, great. Yeah. Ground temperature is going to be in the you know low 50s. Yeah, you know, in a in a basement, so you should be that you, you shouldn't have a problem there, unless it's the part if if you've got water pipes that stand up above ground level in the wall there, that's where it'll be colder than the actual up against the foundation. We're going to take a break. Incidentally, if you want to read our reviews, go to LouisvilleZillow.com or Louisville Google dot com to read our Sokolder team reviews with us till the top of the hour brad lawler owner of the home team inspection service at 844411 team and chuck crosby who's with the crosby law offices he's the head guy there who does wills great closings good guy 4996360 son greg is off today and you can reach me anytime to talk about getting your home on the market now or down the road or in the years to come or buying a home 376-5483 
at 3765483. We are back in a moment on News Radio 840 WHAS. News Radio 840 WHAS, Bob Sekola, the Louisville Real Estate Show with you, continuing till the top of the hour with us, Chuck Crosby, the Crosby Law Offices. You can reach him at 499-6360. Also, Brett Lawler, owner of Home Team Inspection Service, 844411 team is his direct number and this question goes out to chuck uh, an email that came in from wendy who had a a buyer who fell in love with a home earlier this year i think wendy is an agent she said uh, the buyer said to wendy i have to have this house it's my dream home that's what the buyer said after nine office offers and a bidding war wendy was able to get the house for her buyer 10 minutes after the acceptance of the offer when he says the buyer said, I don't want the home anymore. Wendy is wondering, since the buyer wanted out, she didn't want to pay money for any inspections. And she said that she wasn't going to write the earnest check money either. Wondering, Wendy is wondering, how does she proceed? How does she protect her buyer and Wendy's professional reputation? I've seen this happen before. It's the need to want something. And then once you get it, it's like, what? It's buyer's remorse all the way. Right, Chuck? Well, as Spock said in the uh, classic uh, episode of Mock Time, having is not so wonderful a thing as wanting. Anyhow. He's quoting Spock on us, Brad. Hey, there you go. That's great. There you go. Hey, uh, how does she protect the buyer? I don't know that she can at that point, other than telling the buyer that uh, she's got a signed contract. Uh, She needs to perform because, you know, if you don't, if she walks off and they go and sell the property at a lesser amount, uh, you know, arm's length transaction, you can't go sell it to mom and dad for five bucks. But in an arm's length transaction, if they sell it for less, she could be liable to the sellers for the difference between Mm. the two contracts. Mm. Secondly, uh, realtors earn commission on that. Uh, they can go after their commission. Um, and of course, uh, if she didn't write out the good faith deposit, uh, that's something she probably should have had in hand when she was doing the contract. But if it's not there, you can't really take it. Uh, the uh, good thing is, uh, in this market, a lot of these houses will sell quickly at a higher price or a similar price. And then you know, the wonderful legal uh, rule of thumb, no harm, no foul yeah. uh, can come in. You can't get double commission off of something like that. Uh, but it, it'll be a stressful few nights uh, until that property is resold. So um, would, would you set, suggest that she go tell the seller's agent right off the bat, hey, my, my buyer's got remorse? Yeah. 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 And usually they'll call someone like me or Mm -hmm. uh, some other attorney to uh, talk to the the person and and let them know what could happen. Um, But, you know, it's uh, it's still going to be up to that person whether they plan to proceed. Uh, And we run into that. Uh, Most of the people I know go ahead and and, uh, uh, complete the sale and then sell it themselves. Um, But, uh, uh, you know, yeah. What, Nothing what about, the agent can do. What about if she doesn't present the good faith money? If it's not received in three days, isn't the contract declared null and void anyway? Yeah, but that's that. There's there's good uh, there's clean hands involved here. If I do something to sink the contract, mm-hmm. uh, not not so good for me. I can't uh, I, if I don't have clean hands in this, uh, then then I could still be held liable for that. All right. Uh, that's a new term for us, clean hands. We know what yeah. that means normally, washing them, but okay. Yeah, well. The story, yeah. <laughs> All right, Brad, Harry loves to read, and he came across an interesting article, and he wrote us and asked, should we, I guess this is in this article, should we really crack a window in our home year-round? I guess that was the suggestion, at least one of them, in the article. Do you, do you have any thoughts about this? Should we be doing that? No, I know people that do that and they subscribe to that, but modern HVAC systems already are exchanging a a fairly large amount of uh, fresh air into your home, you know, especially, you know, the higher efficiency systems, you're, you're probably talking about a, you know, maybe, you know, 30, 40% um, fresh air exchange rate. So, you know, I think one of the, the the challenges is, you know, this is, you know, November is lung cancer awareness month. So of course, we're kind of thinking a lot about radon right now. And people mm-hmm. are saying, well, I don't want to close the windows, you know, my basement because, you know, get, the radon builds up. I think there's some truth to that. But 
the way you know again just modern hvac circulation you're you're getting a lot of fresh air in there but you know some people like that uh that that real you know that cool breeze blowing in in the in the winter i, I know a lot of people sleep that way at night and you know if i don't think you're hurting anything but you definitely you know uh, you're gonna have to heat that air back up anything that uh you you pull in from outside yeah so it's your own call but not necessarily one that you want to spend money just to have a window open i, I right. hear you loud and clear yeah. chuck ivana wrote us an email uh she's got a renter in one of her homes not paying rent and she went to court to have the renter evicted but she's not sure if the renter can appeal apparently the court said that doing due process on the eviction but can the renter appeal Yes, absolutely. Um, all cases uh, can be appealed. That's the great thing about the American judicial system. Mm. Uh, but the way it works is, um, you know, if the judge, because uh, there's several steps, once you get in front of the judge in a forcible detainer situation, eviction, um, the judge rules says, hey, you have to get out of the property, they're going to have seven days to get out. Mm. Uh, now, during that time, uh, if it's a non payment of rent, or something like that, OK, uh, during that time, if they want to appeal, they have to pay the money in question into court. OK, so if I say you owe a thousand dollars, you didn't pay and I'm evicting you for that thousand dollars. If you want to appeal, you have to pay the thousand dollars into the court filing fees and then it gets bumped up to uh, circuit court, which is mm. the, the appeals court for district. Um, so, yeah, you can do that. Now, um, technically, there's got to be some reason uh to appeal you can't just appeal uh say oh you know not show up not have any arguments and then appeal the the circuit court will look at that and go well you, know, you don't have any basis of appeal here hmm. um however that's kind of a moot point because let's say that i don't even show up to the eviction hearing the judge rules against me i go to uh, uh appeal the thing um i'm gonna have to pay in that money but i appeal it well, the I'm going to have uh, so many days, 20 to file the written appeal, and then they're going to have to file. They'll have 20 days to file a counter, and then it goes in front of the judge uh, sometime thereafter, usually several weeks. And then once the judge makes his uh, ruling, then there's a 30 day appeals period there. Um, so you can really drag this out, and it is an area where there can be some disingenuous uh, activity, but usually, usually it goes pretty quick after an appeal. And people wonder why I never got into buying and then renting homes, and you just heard one of the good reasons that I don't do this. It's tough. Brad, uh, we received an email from Morgan, who is buying his first home and is wondering what questions should he ask a home inspector after inspecting the home that he is buying? Good question. So after? I would argue that he needs to be asking some questions before, um, like get a copy of the sample report. And make sure. Yeah, you know, I think. Get and, no, I think. But, yeah, no, I get that. I, yeah. I see what you're saying, but I think he's right. wondering: is there anything he needs to ask the inspector? Yeah. To know about the house, things like so that. So yeah. here, what I would say is anything that the home inspector is talking to him about when they're there at the inspection doing a walkthrough, I would make sure that you ask the inspector: is this going into your report? Okay, is that going into your report? Because that's 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 the one thing. After the report's written, I think you know it, it, it. Every buyer needs to read the entire report, all of the report, every page of the report, because the the inspection report itself is not just a one or two page summary at the beginning or at the end. It's it's those 30, 40, 50, 110 pages, whatever the home inspector is writing up, but. It really the the buyer needs to feel very open and free to ask the inspector about anything they don't understand because they may be talking technical language that is not known to the buyer. There's no there, there's there's no embarrassment. There's no shame in asking the inspector what they mean by something. You know, call call the inspector, talk to them. We get those calls in our office all the time. People don't understand, you know, what we mean by sub panels and why they're they're wired a little bit differently. And it's like, well, what is a sub panel? So, you know, we explain those. But yeah, anything they should never be left with a question that they don't understand a part of the report. So that you know really read the entire report and anything you don't understand, pick up the phone, call your inspector and say, hey, what do you mean by? And the other thing is agents, you know, are 
all different experience levels. Some are very ex experienced and can explain what the report means. Many can't. And so I think for agents too, if you don't understand what it is the home inspector is, is writing there, just ask, please, please ask them so they've got a complete understanding. Because the worst thing that can happen is 90 days after the inspection is done, they move into the house and they say, hey, this is happening. I didn't know anything about it. The inspector goes, yeah, that's what we talked about, you know, in the report. It's like, oh, I didn't know that's what you actually meant. I didn't know I had to maintain that. I didn't know I needed to, you know, call someone out to look at that. So those, those are probably the big things that, you know, after the inspection is done, you want to ask about. And it's funny, in the next show that we talk to you is the question about why do I need to read the whole report? Well, we'll get to that at, at a later date. Chuck, I think we've got time for one more question. Um, John sent us this email. He's desperately looking to buy a home but can only afford to rent right now. And John asks in the email, if he finds a rent to own, uh, what are some of the precautions he should take in paperwork? And what are the drawbacks to renting then and buying a rent to own home? We only got about minute left. Okay, first problem is uh, title exam. You want to make sure that if you do choose to uh, exercise an option to purchase, that they can, in fact, sell it to you. Most people wait until they decide to purchase the property. I think it should be done up at the beginning. The second thing is uh, they're going to ask you for an option fee. You need to be darn certain that this is what you intend to do. Um, I can tell you I've written up hundreds and hundreds of lease options, uh, which is what we're talking about, uh, and probably closed only a few of them. I mean, the percentage is extremely small. A lot of people will uh, do that option. Then, you know, these people bail, don't buy the property. They get to keep the money. It's usually a non-refundable option fee. Uh, yeah. Those are the things that I would look for. Plus, have somebody read the lease option. Um, you know, usually it's going to be the, the person who's selling the property that gets someone to put that together. Uh, all lease options are not created equal. Have your own attorney, like a Chuck Crosby, review yeah. that for you. Yeah. All right. We're out of time. That was the voice of the Chuck Crosby at the Crosby Law Offices, 499 Six three six zero. Brad Lawler also with us. Home Team Inspection Service, eight four 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 one one. Team, and for me, if you want me to come and talk about selling your home or buying a home, go to bobsellmyhome dot com or give me a call at three seven six five four eight three. Hope you had a great Thanksgiving weekend. I'll see you next week on News Radio eight forty WHAS. <laughs>